So today we continue with a uh, uh, special question and answer session with Bante. So the last we have deal with harmonious perspective and harmonious uh, thoughts. So today is a special. This one more deal with sealer. We harmonious speech, harmonious actions, and harmonious lifestyle. I like this translation, lifestyle, not life livelihood. So can Bante explain about this uh, three concept of harmonious speech, harmonious actions, and harmonious uh, lifestyle? So. Uh, last time, did we explain uh, harmonious perspective? Ah, uh, yes. Hmm? Yeah, how many perspectives and how many thoughts? Orientation. Orientation, um, yeah. Huh? Orientation. That was explained. Yes. So, what is left is harmonious speech, harmonious action, and yeah. harmonious life. Huh? Life, uh, lifestyle. Well, to understand that. Uh, uh, I think we have to repeat the first part. Uh, the important thing to understand is to understand what are called the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths is simply to understand Dukkha, Samudaya, Nirodha and Magga. Dukkha is what I call the problem of existence. The problem of existence is really a conflict between what we might call nature and our wishes or desire, our emotions. Our emotions are in conflict with nature. That is the problem. Now, we are aware of nature. <clears throat> Through our thinking mind. So we have two minds. One is the thinking mind and the emotional mind. So emotions are not the same thing as thinking. The thinking mind is what is called mano. Mano is the thinking mind and the emotional mind is what we call chitta. Now when a child is born into this world, the child has only the emotional mind. The moment the child is born, what does the child do? The first thing, child cries. Now that crying itself is an emotional excitement. So we start with the emotional excitement. Although the child is emotionally excited, the child is not aware of whatever is going on in the world. That child doesn't know why that child was born. And the child doesn't know where the child is. Child doesn't know anything. There is no thinking mind there. There is only the emotion. 
So only as the child grows up, the child becomes aware that there is a person called mother and that there is one's own body that is identified as myself. At the beginning, child is not aware of the distinction between the myself and the body the, and the mind, uh, the mother. Mother is also not known. So gradually the child begins to know. A very interesting thing happened, which I observed. I don't know whether other people observed. <laughs> Every morning, when we go out for breakfast here, there was a small child that is being brought by the those who are coming, the daikas, the small, you, you, are, you know the child. At the beginning, the child was just brought, the child was not aware of whatever is going on. But gradually, as the child grew up, because every day we see the child. Now the child is aware of other people there. There are other people. And now the child is also aware that someone gives something to the child, the child takes it. And now, when you try to take that away again, so, so, the child doesn't like to say, no. so, so, once it is given, he, she doesn't want to give it up again, because it has become mine. Now, this thing that is given is mine. I can't give it to you. <laughs> it's like that. So you can't take it away from me. So you see the I and the mind and things like that, you begin to see how the child begins to gradually become aware of other people. There are other people here. This is myself and that sort of thing. Very interesting to note that. <clears throat> so the important thing is, this thinking mind gradually becomes aware of things and not only that, that everything that is, that every object that, is, that the child is aware of comes and goes. Even if someone gives something, he <laughs> got this mind, but next time takes away. So, everything comes and goes, comes and goes. That coming and going is what the Buddha called anicca. And once it comes, we become attached to it. And we want to make it mine. But it doesn't last, it goes away. And that makes you unhappy. If it goes away, it becomes unhappy. That is the dukkha. Dukkha is that it goes away. So it comes and goes. And gradually people begin to understand that people are born into this world and gradually grows up and ultimately begins to grow old and fall sick and ultimately dies. You see, this is the problem. You see, when I was a child, I was uh, sent out of my hometown 
to a school outside and I was boarded in that school, the school hostel. So I was really seven years old when I was sent there. And uh, when I was about uh, ten years old, my I had two sisters, the elder sister died. So someone came and told me that the, my sister died. I started crying and crying and crying. There was no end to cry. So I was thinking, I, that was the sister that I liked. The, the younger sister I didn't like very much because she used to come and uh, uh, quarrel with me. <laughs> but <laughs> but the older sister I like now she's dead. So I started crying and crying. But gradually I began to realize that Everyone has to die. That my older sister, not only the older sister, other sister will also die someday. My father will die someday. My mother will die someday. And I will also die someday. This is the nature of life. <coughs> that got into my mind. After some time, my father died. I never cried. Then after some time, my mother died. Never cried. Because I have accepted the fact death is the common thing in life. I was aware of death and so that is a fact of life. I accepted that. Then my other sister also died after a long time and I was aware of it and that my other sister had a son, he also died. So these are now seen as natural things happening in the world and it doesn't have any effect on me to the extent that I begin to cry. So time will come when I also have to die, so I'll be uh, ready for that. What else? <laughs> So this is the nature of life. So the important thing is that once we have begin, begun to understand the facts of life, which are anicca, dukkha and anatta. Anatta means we cannot own and possess everything in the world, including our own body and our own life. Itself. We cannot own and possess anything in the world. Everything comes and goes and if we cling to things, we become unhappy, that's all. Dukkha. And once we have understood that we don't own anything in the world, we have to give up everything. That is the nature of life. 
So uh, the problem of life is that our emotions want things to be otherwise. Our emotions want nature to be different. And that is the problem of life. It has become a problem because the emotions are not willing to accept the realities of life. This is the problem. So once we have understood that, that understanding is the Sammaditti. And once we have understood that, the next step is to turn away from the emotional disturbance. It is the emotion that is going against the realities of life. That is the point. All religions are really trying to say the same thing, <coughs> but they say it in different ways. That is the problem. Now, instead of talking about the realities of life, and the emotions are going against that. What they say is, instead of saying reality, they say God. The realities of life, they call God. And we are not obeying the rules of God. So the emotions are called we. So we become the emotions and the reality becomes God. So in other words, it is shown that we are going against God. So what religion wants is to unite with God. To unite with God means our emotions must accept the realities. You see? So we see it is the same thing, but they are using different symbols, that's all. This is the difference between the teachings of the Buddha and the other religions, these are, other religions are what are called theistic religions. Theistic means thinking in terms of gods, gods and devils. The devil is what is going against the realities. So God, because we have this tendency, because we have two minds, the emotional mind and the thinking mind, the thinking mind becomes in on line with God and the emotional mind is going against God, that is the, that becomes the devil. So the thinking mind becomes the devil and uh, the, sorry, the emotional mind becomes the devil and the thinking mind is the God. So it's always a conflict here. That conflict is the Dukkha. So we are trying to uh, harmonize this conflict. That is what is called conflict resolution. Conflict resolution means to bring about harmony. And this is why I use the word 
harmonious perspective. The word harmonious perspective is to understand how to harmonize, to resolve the conflict, conflict resolution. That is the meaning of this whole thing. And so once we have understood this, then our aim in life is to get rid of these emotions. So the complete absence of these emotions is what is called nirvana. Now we have this word nirvana. Nir means non. Vana means shaking. The non-shaking of the mind, nirvana, is perfect tranquility of mind. The tranquility of mind that can never be disturbed the tranquility of mind that can never be disturbed is what is called nirvana. And there in the words of the Buddha it is called akuppa cheto vimutti. Akuppa means the imperturbable. Imperturbable. Perturbation means excitement. Imperturbable means that cannot be excited. Imperturbable. Akupa cheto vimukti. Imperturbable serenity of mind. Serenity is the tranquility the stillness of the mind, the stillness that can never be shaken, <coughs> the imperturbable serenity of mind is nirvana. That is the meaning of nirvana. So nirvana becomes the goal so when nirvana becomes the goal of life, so if that is the goal, then that is where we have to go. Huh? So when we talk about samma ditti and samma sankappa, sankappa is the reorientation, the reorientation means turning about. If we are going north, we turn to go south. That is what we call a U-turn. A U-turn. If your car is going towards the north and you turn to go towards the south, that is called a U-turn. So that U-turn is the reorientation, the reorientation of the mind. So once we have turned in the right direction, the next step is to press the accelerator, then we go. So then you are going in the right direction, that is all. The main thing is to turn in the right direction. Once you have turned in the right direction, however much you press your accelerator, you are going only in the right direction, you are not going in the wrong direction. That turning your mind in the right direction and continuing to go, that is the right speech, the right action, and the right life. 
that is the meaning it's not only just speaking the right words you are also doing the right actions and not only doing the right actions once in a way but your whole life you are doing it your whole life is going in the right direction it's not only once in a way you do the right thoughts and the right actions you are doing the your whole life is going in that direction that is the way samma vacha samma kammant samma ajiva some people try to translate ajiva as the job that you do it is not just changing your job you are changing your whole life this is the important thing to understand just changing your job is not enough you have to change your whole life this is the important thing samma ajiva means the right life and to emphasize that i have put the word lifestyle because the psychologists the modern psychologists use that word lifestyle it was uh, really alfred adler during the time of uh, sigmund freud that was in the beginning of the 20th century sigmund freud came up as a psychologist and uh, with this psychologist came this other person uh, alfred adler what i find is that sigmund freud saw the the first truth and the second truth and also saw that it is necessary to get rid of the emotions he also saw that the mind was that in this two ways the thinking mind and the emotional mind Freud saw this thinking mind and the emotional mind the thinking mind he called the ego and the emotional mind he called the id 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 so he was aware of these things and uh, but it was adler who began to think in terms of the noble eightfold path the the last one that you need this reorientation of the mind and uh, uh so the changing of the lifestyle that is the important thing that uh, we have to understand it is very important to understand the distinction between uh, uh the ideas of sigmund freud and the ideas of alfred adler they of course began to think that they are going in two different directions but actually they were going on the same thing but there was a little conflict because they didn't see each other properly that is what happened and today the modern freudians who are called the neo freudians they are called the neo freudians and these neo freudians became aware to some extent they they thought that uh, sigmund freud's psychology was called the id psychology they called it the id psychology and uh, 
the psychology of adler they saw as the ego psychology that means they began to uh, separate them and they began they they didn't understand this fully because they didn't relate that to buddhism the actual fact is that these psychologists really got hold of the buddhist concept but they didn't get hold of the concept fully they didn't understand buddhism fully because they were ignorant about buddhism the people who became uh, followers of freud knew only freud they didn't know buddhism and uh, so th- they couldn't understand this connection and uh, so they saw adler's psychology different from freud's psychology and a confusion was created because of that so it is very important if we begin to understand the teachings of the buddha properly then you begin to see this in proper perspective it's only when you see it in this uh, buddhist point of view that you begin to see the problem in the proper way but very few people um, understand buddhism and very few people who think about adler they they get told of one aspect of it those who get told of freud get another aspect of it it is like this elephant and the blind man you see the blind man one man touching the tail thinks that the elephant is like a broom another man <laughs> touching the <laughs> ear thinks the elephant is like a fan and so on you see so seeing only one part is not enough you have to see the whole thing and to see the whole thing you have to understand the teachings of the buddha it is only when you understand the teachings of the buddha that you begin to see the problem in all its aspects it is like looking at the elephant in the proper way and understanding the elephant so uh so the f- first five things samaditti samma sankap samma vacha samma khamant samma ajiv and the most important thing here is the goal the goal orientation and the goal it become nibbana nibbana means the nirvana that is the imperturbable serenity of mind the tranquility or stillness of the mind which can never be disturbed so once you have achieved that uh, goal orientation that is where you become a buddhist so when you when you have understood that <laughs> and you t- once you have taken nirvana to be the goal that is the starting point and so from there onwards you begin to go towards nirvana that is the starting point hmm so have you stopped <laughs> we no just part that is what you wanted hmm 
What's your next question? <laughs> I still cannot. Huh? I still cannot get about the summer watcher. Hmm. Summer watcher. How? Well, samma vacha simply is the right speech. That is all. The right speech is something that uh, most people who studied this know. When we take the five, five precepts, we speak of the right speech. Now, one very important thing to understand is when we take the five precepts, we say panati pata aditta la adidna dana kame sumicha chara and then all that is about the action part. Then we say Musavada. So when we say Musavada, we are saying that we, we do not tell lies. Now when you say you do not tell lies, does that mean that you are going to tell the truth? <laughs> ah, that is the thing. The important thing is telling the truth is also not the right thing. <laughs> if the truth is something that hurts the other person, then you should not be telling that truth. Say, for example, you meet a person and you know that that person's mother was a prostitute. So you say, your mother is a prostitute. You think that that, that person will like that? Ah, that means... If it hurts the other person, you should not be telling the truth. Or you heard another person saying something bad to you. So you say, I, I come and tell you, oh, so and so told me like this, told me this to you, about you like this. That will hurt the other person. So that is what is called carrying tails around. Huh? If it is a thing like that, then that truth should not be told. You see, to avoid telling truth doesn't mean that we have to be uh, avoid uh, telling false things doesn't mean that we should be telling the truth all the time. That is the important thing. So, that one precept, Musavada, includes four precepts. The four things, Parsavacha, Pisunavacha, Samprapalapa, Musavada, four things. Parsavacha means saying something that hurts the other person. That is the Parsavacha. Pisunavacha means carrying uh, tails around, which is also not good. Samprapalapa means saying things that are truth but hurting other people and uh, misleading other people, uh, that kind of thing, the samprapalapa. So, telling lies is the other thing. So, the, so, when we say you should not tell lies, 
you are also saying that telling the truth also has to be carefully done only the if the truth is not something that hurts other people so the four things are there included in that one thing and then the other thing is taking intoxicants so the taking intoxicants is also uh something to be avoided because once you take the intoxicants you can be lying and telling all the bad things and everything all the bad things can be done by taking the intoxicants because you lose your mind when you take the intoxicants you can't think straight so this is why that has to be avoided it is not only taking intoxicants but being carried away by the emotions that is why when you say uh uh what is it taking intoxicants sura sura mere ha sura mere maja pama ha sura mere maja sura mere means the intoxicants madj phamadattana that is that part is getting emotionally excited madj phamadattana means the emotional excitement that breaks down all the rules don't be carried away by the emotions that is the important thing there don't be carried away by the emotions so that is why even if you understand that these things are wrong to be done if you are carried away by the emotions you will not pay attention to the rules the breaking of the precepts comes through the emotional excitement when you are emotionally excited there are these uh, people who say oh you have taken the five precepts oh the five precepts are for the temple not for the hope so there are people who say that like that because you are carried away by the emotions when you come home you are carried away by the emotion <laughs> which is not the correct thing so it is very important if you want to practice the five precepts you have to stop being carried away by the emotion that's the most important thing so this includes everything now a very important statement is that uh, what we called uh, uh Uh, this word uh, problem with my
what what is that the autonomous reality autonomous morality and Mor- autonomous ah that is it. the autonomous morality and the heteronomous morality silabata parama ha ha silabata parama silabata parama there you are this is very important to understand that sila bat paramas parato amasati parato amasati apara mattam samadhi sangvat nikam now these are the words that we have to uh, understand paramas means para means foreign the word now in uh, sri lanka most of you are not aware of the the language of sri lankan there is a word called paraya ha oh, yeah. huh? paraya very bad word about somebody podcast no paraya really means foreigner yeah, outcast, yeah. paraya means foreigner alien so those days in sri lanka when the white people came they were called parayas <laughs> they paraya the white people were called paraya because they are the foreigners really paraya means foreigner but later uh, paraya became a bad word bad word because uh, uh, foreigners were hated there because first the portuguese came and the portuguese came and created trouble there then the dutch came and the dutch created more trouble then the british came and the british british became the most powerful people and the british chased away the dutch and the portuguese and the t- they took over so they were regarded as parias but not only that when the foreigners came they started churches and converted the people the buddhists were converted into christianity and when the buddhists were converted into christianity they hated the christians but so that's why the whole problem was that and uh, not only that people respected the monks because they were all buddhists but when the foreigners came they started teaching the children in the school that monks are very bad people so they started picking holes in the monks so that means this all the time they came, began to criticize the monks so this was all done by the christians and those who uh, studied in the christian schools became christians automatically because from childhood they were taught because the christians knew how to convert people to christianity they knew that the adults were difficult to convert so they wanted to teach the children and ask them to send their children to school so when they came out of the school the children were christians and because they have been taught that the world was created by a god and christ is the son of the god and so they began to believe all that and they started criticizing the monks so that is what happened ultimately 
so gradually my uh, those days of course all the people were not rich people so what they did was if you become a person who studies in the christian school you get a good job and to become get a good job is to become a rich person so but the problem is to send the child to the christian schools you also need a certain amount of money so what the father does is the oldest son is sent to the christian school and the others are sent uh, to the secondary schools they they had the secondary school and the christian school so my my grandfather sent the oldest child to the christian school and at that time the christian the highest christian school was uh, st thomas's college that's a catholic school so ultimately he came out as a christian <laughs> he he came out as a christian and not only christian he became a lawyer and not only just a lawyer he became a prominent lawyer and he became one of the uh, state council or what you, they had this government uh, 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 divided into two uh, uh, senate and the parliament Huh? the senate and the parliament yeah par- no before the parliament yes, at sir. that time there was no parliament provisional they had the uh, uh, provisional council uh, the senate which is yeah the uh, executive council and the legal some council there yeah. judiciary yeah so he became a member of the judicial and ultimately he became one of the people who went to appeal for independence so he became a prominent man but then my father of course went to the singali school <laughs> so he was of a lower category but <laughs> but he was a buddhist so my father didn't want to send me to the uh, christian school because uh, he thought i might become a christian so i was sent to the buddhist school so that is how ultimately i became a monk <laughs> because <laughs> i i was sent to the buddhist school so things like that has happened so the important thing is uh, to understand that uh, we are but morality did we say heteronomous morality. heteronomous morality so heteronomous morality is morality means the you are disciplined in behavior based on what others have asked you to do that means not because you want to do the right thing other people want you to do the right thing and therefore you obey the other people that is the heteronomous morality even if you do it because buddha wanted you to do it that is heteronomous morality 
But if you understand the value of being good and doing good, that is autonomous morality. So the important thing is to understand the harmonious perspective. That means you begin to understand why you should not do the wrong things. You have to understand right and wrong by yourself. And based on your understanding, you do the right thing. That is autonomous morality. So you give up the heteronomous morality and because if you do the heteronomous morality because other people want you to do it, you might do the wrong thing in secret so that other people will not see it. You see, heteronomous morality makes you do things in secret. But if you understand for yourself the right thing to do, then you don't have to do anything in secret. <laughs> because you understand by yourself. The autonomous morality is the better morality than the heteronomous morality. That's the important thing. That is the meaning of uh, Silabhata Paramasa. So the Sota Panna means the one who has entered the stream. Sota Panna is the one who has entered the stream. That means the Noble Eightfold Path becomes the stream that ultimately carries you to Nirvana. It's like the river that goes and falls into the ocean. In the same way, if you throw a log into the river, the river will carry the log to the ocean. So in the same way, once you have got the harmonious perspective in the proper way, and you got the harmonious orientation turning in the right direction, then you gradually flow into Nirvana. So that is called entering the stream. That entering the stream is the beginning, the starting point. Finished, huh? Oh, finished. <laughs> no question. Any questions? <laughs> question, no. So far, okay. Questions? Uh, we go further next time, huh? Or tomorrow, uh, maybe. Others? Any what? others questions? I think for Sama Wacha is quite okay. To the mic. We are recording, so we don't mind. We don't have something to drink, huh? Water. Uh, Pante, good evening. Um, Often time I experience not having enough time uh, to do the things that I want to do or plan the things that I want to do. So, um, what is the right time management from Buddha perspective? Please comment. Thank you. Well, it's an important uh, point. Now, this time problem, you want to do something and uh, you don't have time to do it. 
thank you. Very important. <clears throat> the important thing is not that you don't have time. The important thing is your, what is the word? Huh? What? Priority. What is that word you use? Priority. Priority. That's right. That is the important word there. Priority. What is it imp that is important to you? So you have two things. You have to do something and you have to do another thing. There are two things here. So you have time to do what you really want to do. So this is why we say we have two minds. There is the thinking mind and there is the emotional mind. Emotional mind wants to do one thing and your thinking mind wants to do another thing. This is the problem. So. <clears throat> Are you uh, interested in carrying out what your emotional mind tells you or you want to carry out what the thinking mind tells you? That is the important thing. So the important thing is it is the thinking mind that tells you the right thing to do. Emotional mind is telling you the wrong thing. But very often we are carried away by the emotions. So there, this is why the Buddha pointed out in a very in, in, important verse Chittena niyati loko, chittena parikasati, chittas eka dhammas sabbeva vasamangva gu. Chittena, chitta refers to that emotional mind. Chittena niyati loko, the world is dominated by chitta, the emotional mind. The world is dominated by the emotional mind. Chittena niyati loko. Chittena parikasati. The chitta carries you in different directions. That means you are carried away by emotions. You are carried away by emotions. Parikasati means being carried away. Chittas ekadhammas. Chitta is the one thing. Sabbeva vasamangva gu. Everyone is spellbound to chitta. Everyone is carried away by chitta. 
you know it's very interesting to understand that the modern scientists i won't say psychologists this is more than the psychologists people who have been doing research on the brain now our friend billy has been showing these things with all the diagrams and all the pictures uh, several times that uh, we have uh, the the brain they speak of the evolution of the brain and there are three stages in the evolution of the brain first part that evolved is what is called the brain stem the brain stem is found in the reptiles the reptiles are like the fish and the frog and uh, the various reptiles huh? even the snake and all these reptiles they are not frightened of people they begin to attack the people also they because the snakes they come and sting and you might even die as a result you see that uh, it's very fact with difficulty if a frog enters this room to chase the frog away it's also very difficult because they are not frightened but if you want to uh catch a mouse or rat they will run away you you, you not easy for it to catch frog you can even kick the frog out frog comes back again so it's like that you say the reptiles their main thing is to eat find food and reproduce those are the only thing they want to do but what are called the mammals mammals are the animals who begin to feed the young with milk huh? milk giving animals the mammals they began to develop what is called the limbic system it is in the limbic system that you get what is called the emotions and the human beings are also supposed to be animal and uh, mammals so human beings also have emotions this is why the infant the human infant begins to cry and also they have the emotions first but later another part develops which is called the cerebrum that cerebrum and the important part of the cerebrum is what is called the cortex cerebral cortex the thinking part so the thinking part develops later in the human being at birth the thinking part is not fully developed this is why it takes a few years before the child begins to be able to think properly and so because it is a late comer 
thinking part is a late comer it is weaker than the emotional part so when the thinking part and the emotional part come in conflict pulling in two different directions emotion wins this is the problem you see this is why sigmund freud the psychologist pointed out that emotions are instincts instincts means you are born with it you cannot get rid of emotions this is what freud thought we cannot get rid of emotions This is why when I went to United States to talk to people about the Buddha, I told them the Buddha is a person who got rid of all emotions. That man began to laugh. How can you get rid of emotions? Sigmund Freud said, you cannot get rid of emotions. How did the Buddha do that? he didn't want to believe that but it was later that some psychologists came up and pointed out that there is a thing called what is called the cognitive psychologists there is a cognitive part in the mind which is the thinking part it is the thinking part that really arouses the emotions the emotions are things there are emotions are not permanent things it comes and goes but it gets excited only when the thinking part gives ideas it is the thinking part that starts the emotional arousal this is the important thing to understand when when the thinking part is controlled the emotions are controlled that is what they began to point out then been 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 we begin to understand the teachings of the buddha there is a book of verses called the dhamma pada there are the first verse in the dhamma pada says mano pubbangama dhamma what does that mean mano is the thinking part Pubbangama means comes before, precedes. The mano precedes all experience. That is what it says. Dhamma is the experience. The mano, the thinking part precedes all experience. Therefore, by thinking in the right way, emotions can be got rid of if you begin to think in the right way so although the thinking part came later than the emotional part in the evolution of the brain the thinking part is the part that controls but you know there is a book written by a psychologist called emotional intelligence and he pointed out that there is what is called a hijack 
you know what a hijack is the people get into the plane and they begin to control the pilot they be threaten the pilot that i will kill you if you don't uh, obey what i said and get the pilot to run in the way that they direct you see so a thing like that happens why because you see we we have what we told earlier when we speak of the mind we have uh, three activities of the body that we call the mind the three activities are uh uh perception vijnana vijnana is perception vijnana mano and chitta vijnana is also called mind mano is also called mind and chitta is also called mind but these are three different activities of the body there is no such thing as a mind is not a thing separate from the body there is no such thing as a mind that's the important thing that the modern psychologists discovered the word psychology means the study of the mind but when they started with that word psychology they searched for the mind they couldn't find the mind so they started defining psychology in a different way they said psychology is not the study of the mind psychology is the study of human behavior so they use the word behavior because they 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 couldn't find the mind to study so the fact is that there is no separate thing called a mind you know there is a sutra in the majjhima nikaya it is called the maha tanha sankhaya sutra maha tanha sankhaya sutra in that sutra there they there was a monk during the time of the buddha who was saying that it is this vijnana that when a person dies that vijnana comes out and it runs and enters another body this is uh, what is uh, today called uh, uh transmigration huh transmigration what transmigration ah transmigration transmigration is that they don't call it the mind they call it the soul when a person dies the soul comes out and goes and occupies another body that is called transmigration or reincarnation the word reincarnation means the same thing the incarnation means occupying the body the soul comes out of the body and re enters another body 
that is called reincarnation some call it transmigration both mean a similar thing and at that time that monk calls sati his name was sati and he believed that this was the buddha called him and said you are wrong the vijnana is not a thing that can travel like that vijnana simply is an activity of the senses the senses when stimulated by the environment there is a reaction of the sense organ to the stimulation and that is what you call perception so there is the eye perception ear perception nose perception tongue perception body perception these are the five senses that react to stimulation by the environment he said that is all that vijnana is it cannot travel anywhere but today there are people who try to say that vijnana comes out of the body and travels and it can come back again to the body all that is nonsense from a buddhist perspective so this is why there is no such thing as a mind there is only the body and the body it is the activity of the f- five senses which is called vijnana and then the activity of the brain which is mainly the activity of the cerebral cortex that is the thinking part and that is what is called mano that activity is the mano it's not the brain that is the mano it is the activity of the cerebral cortex which is the thinking activity which is the mano and then comes the emotional activity that is a message goes from the brain to the limbic system there is a special part of the limbic system which is called the amygdala and that is the part that sends a message to the glands and the glands begin to secrete a hormone into the blood and the blood carries the hormone to the whole body because the heart begins to pump and it goes to the whole body and changes take place in different parts of the body not just one part and that is what that change in the body the function of the body that you call the emotion so the emotion is not simply one point in the body the entire body becomes activated in the emotional excitement so you see the problem is that in these other animals where the the brain was not developed to the thinking part what started the emotional excitement was from the senses 
there was a telephone wire going to the amygdala. That telephone wire was really what is called the nerve. The nerve from the senses straight to the amygdala and the amygdala sends the message to the glands and the secretion of the hormones take place and the emotion is aroused. So when it came to the human being, there was the brain activity. So what happened was there was a nerve going in the human being. One nerve goes from the senses like the eye to the brain. Another nerve going from the brain to the amygdala. So two nerves go. And the nerve going from the sense organ to the brain is a longer track than the nerve going to the amygdala. That is, a nerve going to the amygdala is a shorter track. So that means the message goes to the amygdala before going to the brain. Because that is the shorter cut. So if suddenly a big noise like a thunder comes here, you get excited. Then again, you next moment, you realize, oh, no, don't worry. It's not a big thing. It's only just a thunder. You see, but before it goes to the... the brain, the message has already gone through the amygdala and you got excited. You see, that is what is called the hijack. So if the hijack takes place in that way, the problem comes up, but then later you recover and say, no, don't worry, it's not. You understand the difference, huh? So if you want uh, to understand it more, you should talk to uh, Billy and he will explain it in, with all the diagrams and all that, he'll be able to tell you. So the important thing is that uh, these are very important to understand and uh, this uh, talk about uh, time, we don't have the time to do this. That time is another excuse that you are giving yourself. And uh, so I have a lot of work to do. I have no time to meditate. <laughs> if you, if you, do, if you do that, that is you are giving preference to that work, and you are not giving preference to the meditation. This is the problem. So when you begin to understand these things and how even the modern scientists are aware of these problems now. And so it is very important to understand these things properly.